and welcome along to this end of year Razor Special where I look back with Neil Cairns, Guy Henderson and our newest member Raya Al Salahi. Welcome. Thank you. This year we've spent a lot of time in nature to gain insight into some of the topics discussed at COP15, the UN Biodiversity Conference. But when it came to the big science, we sent along our biggest brain, I think, <laughs> Boss Neil Cairns. Yeah, sure. What a huge privilege for you to go to this place, because it's one of the most respected science centres in the world, isn't it? CERN is like uh, every science journalist's dream. It's like, I don't know, it's like going to Shangri-La for a science journalist. And I got to go to a place at, which is part of CERN, the Centre European Research Nucléaire, apologies to all French people. I went to the Antimatter Factory, which is part of CERN, where they build antimatter. And they're trying to understand why there is so little antimatter in the universe. But to do that, because there is almost none, they first have to build it. So I didn't really feel like a big brain when I was there. It was just mind blowing. But more mind blowing um, than the amazing physics that, that's there is that these people have d devoted their lives to trying to understand this thing which is so rare in the universe. But if we can come to grips with whether it's any different from normal matter, our understanding of the whole universe will open up. So we get a cloud of positrons, which we produce from a source, a cloud of antiprotons, and we coax them together very gently. Remember, we're trying to make something that's cold. That means it's not moving very much. On the atomic scale, we have the antiproton, which is the nucleus, the positron, gets captured, they attract each other, and now we have an antihydrogen atom, which is neutral. No net charge, right? Of one negative charge, one positive, it's neutral. But it's a little bit magnetic. And so this magnetic configuration makes kind of a bathtub to hold the antihydrogen. That's the magnetic field. That's the shape of the magnetic well that right. they're trapped in. In order to hold on to it, it has to be extremely cold. And by cold, I mean one half of a degree above absolute zero. And that means so it's really slowed down. It's not flying all over the place. That's right. So. That, that temperature in this case is a measure of the velocity of the motion, right? Yeah. So we're essentially making a very dilute gas of anti-hydrogen atoms that are confined in a magnetic bottle. Alpha is the only experiment that's ever succeeded in doing this, and it's taken the whole of my career to learn how to both produce antihydrogen and then to trap it so that you can study it, right? And, and that's what this is all about. So that's a key thing. It's, it's an atom. It's anti-hydrogen, not an anti-proton. Exactly. Right. The mirror image, if you will. Right. Or, or the evil twin, as I prefer <laughs> to think of it. I found this even more amazing than the incredibly precise experimental physics going on here. How does a person dedicate their whole working life to understanding the properties of something as ephemeral and elusive as an atom of anti-hydrogen? The burning question is very simple. Do hydrogen and anti-hydrogen obey the same laws of physics, right? We don't know. That's an experimental question. What motivates it is this elephant in the room, which is the observed lack of antimatter in the universe. We simply don't understand that. We don't understand why you and I are made of matter instead of antimatter. It should be possible to have a universe that's made of antimatter. Some reason the Big Bang took a left turn instead of a right turn, and here we are. Now, I'm not promising that any of the research here can answer that question, but it's clearly if you can get your hands on some antimatter, you should take a good hard look at it. That's what's going on here. So, Neil, did you work on any other stories that any of us will actually be able to understand? I'm not entirely sure I understood it, but we did our best to make that story accessible because the physics there is so mind-blowing. But for me, the other great privilege of this year was to travel back 4,600 years in time with Professor Timothy Darville from Bournemouth University, who's worked out how Stonehenge may have worked as a calendar. And he's an archeologist who's devoted his whole life to this place. And I've been there before as a tourist, but to be inside the ring of the stones with somebody who knew everything about it was absolutely wonderful. 
So when they put the stones together, they build them on a what we call principal axis. And that axis stretches from the horizon on the midsummer sunrise, which is to the northeast, that's through the stones there, right down to the midwinter sunset, which is towards the southwest, okay, which sunrise. is sunrise there, sunset, sunset over there. And the, and the stones, the stones are arranged that. around them. So that axis runs right through the middle of all the sarsen stones and the way that they're set up. That's the first clue that this is about timekeeping. Yeah, this is the first clue, that it's about timekeeping, and it's about the sun. The sun is the crucial element of this. So tell me how your calendar works. Well, we've been looking at the stones and wondering what they all mean and thinking about the integrity of them. And then I noticed that there was a pattern to the numbers in the way that the stones were built. And the obvious starting point was the notion that there was a month represented by 30 days, represented by the 30 uprights of the Sarsen Circle. And 30 days in a month of that duration gives you a nice starting point for a calendar, which is actually not so unfamiliar to us today. We start with midwinter, I think, right. because the shape of this interior structure yes. takes the eye. These, these are graded in height, you can probably see. Oh, right. They're graded in height so that the focus is on that horizon towards the southwest, and that's where the sun sets in the midwinter. So that's a great starting point. So that's day zero, day one or day zero? Well, that's when the calendar starts, as it were, and you start therefore counting from the entranceway. That's your first day of the month, and you go round and you go round 12 times. Oh, OK, so you, you go... Start. End of the year. Or, or beginning of the year. Beginning of the year, yeah. because yeah. you're yeah. waiting for winter to be over. Yeah, exactly. Because it's cold exactly. and it's bitter and you're it's, hungry. Exactly, you want to start the new year much like we do in the middle of winter, in fact, yeah. but you start the new there, you come to the first stone on the circle, which is this one here, yeah. and you go round. OK, so, Tim, I'm the timekeeper. Yep. The priest or the timekeeper. So I've seen midwinter, and I've seen the sun start to move, and I take my marker... And you put it right down there. And I go, day one. Day one. That's day one stone. Day one, month one. Day one, month one. Pick then, it up. And I go. Here we are. Day two. That's it. And right. then everybody who comes into the site can see exactly which day of the month it is. And As I keep doing up. this. Every day you move it on one. For 30 days. For 30 days, by which time you're back where we started. But Guy, getting back to biodiversity, you reminded us of the importance of the notion of a keystone species. Yeah, this was one that was hunted out by the British in, I think, the 15th or 16th century. And only now, initially, we think under quite mysterious circumstances, the beaver started to be reintroduced to parts of England. Um, and then following that, all sorts of studies began to show that these very cute little guys, I might add, were actually able to have this remarkably positive impact on the landscape around them to prevent flooding, to store water more effectively when there's a drought. And so we took an adventure down to Devon to go and visit a chap called Derek Gow, a pioneering rewilder who is reintroducing beavers to the natural landscape. So we got to walk through this incredible um, part of the, the English countryside and see not just the benefit the beavers were having, but all sorts of other animals as well. And the idea is not just about protecting water levels and making the land more resilient, but it's also about the, all of the amazing biodiversity that builds up around that. And it was really an amazing thing to see. And that's what a keystone species is. You save that, you save the whole ecosystem, yeah. right? Well, that's one of the things that Derek mentions in the film as well, is that there are very few animals on Earth that once they are introduced, certainly mammals, um, have such a huge impact on the land. And as soon as they have that impact, the knock-on and the ripple effect to all of these other aspects of the natural world is really quite dramatic. And the beavers have created a permanent water body. And this is one that's visible. So where there would have been no water before, there's water all the time. When the dams are new and fresh and made from sticks and rocks, they're very visible and very obvious. But because beavers use a lot of aquatic plant roots, if you leave them in place long enough, then the plant roots consolidate the structure and what you get is a bank going across. And that's what this now is. So we find these little white sticks um, floating in a dam. They're the first thing you look for because they tell you that the activity is current. And you can see that there's a the wee patch oh, yeah. on, that, on an oak tree there where they've just taken the bark up. But I mean, generally, they could fell a tree like that, but that would be a fairly 
um, you know, substantial commitment and they're not generally going to bother. It's principally willow, aspen, alders and you can see here that what they've done is when it gets to any substantial size is they go around it taking out chips. In the end you end up with this pencil sharpened shape and then boom the tree comes down and then they go up and down the sides taking off the side branches because what they're looking for is this fine nutritious bark here um, and then all the leaves at the top and that's why they're trying to fell the tree. So an outsider might look upon this scene and say well that's quite destructive for nature isn't it? Yes but look at what's growing. Those trees yep. have all been felled by the beavers or that's been felled by the beavers. These trees have a 40 million year old relationship with this animal and when they're felled they regenerate. This tree is entirely in tune, it's partner the beaver and they understand each other well. This is not destruction, this is gardening. This is really cool actually. So they've more recently popped a dam in on the main river just down here. They being the beavers. They being the beavers, yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, as you can see, that backs up quite a lot of still water here. You've got fairly vertical front face, and then the back edge of the dam, we can't really see it, but tapers back down, and they'll push sediment and, and um, stones, anything they can get really into the back of that. So the thickest part of the dam is where the highest force of the water is. So they can, they can be really stable structures. So there's often this fear of what happens when this blows out, but usually they dis disintegrate gradually over time. So parts will come off the top and around the side and then slowly over a winter, they'll disintegrate. Um, and you can see you get lovely features like these deep pools in the lead into the dam and then these lovely shallow riffles on the lead out. So you get these interesting habitats develop. Some really good for certain types of animals and spawning fish. Uh, some are better for adult fish and, and, and different types of uh, macroinvertebrates. Thank you, Guy. Very jealous about the beavers, I must say. Right, that is the end of part one. Uh, please stick around because we have part two coming up. That's if we don't die of cold first. This is very true. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. Welcome back to part two of our end of year razor special. We're looking back at some of our highlights and it's been a year for biodiversity. We have looked at rewilding projects, plants, seagrass, wolves, beavers, bison. Uh, have you been keeping up with all this? I know we haven't actually seen you on screen yet, but I know you've been a girly swat about this and you've been I watching everything that we've done. Have indeed been watching religiously and actually Guy, I've seen you go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum too. Yep micro biodiversity which apparently has been plummeting in recent years obviously every story i work on with razor i enjoy and love deeply but this was one that really stuck with me um, the idea that uh, the way that much of our modern world is built essentially is that um, particularly in urban spaces we like the idea of keeping ourselves away from nature it's kind of how our cities are built they're quite sanitized spaces and I went to a part of East London to chat with a duo of quirky scientists, architects, biologists, who explained to me that, in fact, all of that can be very damaging to our health. And so what they're trying to do is reintroduce healthier microbial diversity in our urban spaces. And their argument is that that will make us all a lot healthier in the long run. And who knew there was a microbe zoo? So exactly that. We went off to Amsterdam to visit one of the world's only microbe zoos. It was absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, the idea that on your fingernails, on your eyebrows, in every part of your body and all around you is possibly the most spectacular safari you could possibly imagine. And there it was in this spectacular museum attached to Amsterdam Zoo it makes me want to walk around with a set of microscopes on my eyes so I can see these incredible things that are there and that actually 
keep us all alive and healthy, that they're very much sort of the centre of the natural world. And they're right there in front of us, even if we can't see them with the naked eye. Here we go. Okay, so I'll step on here with you. Yep. So this is us. Oh my God, that is actually us. Yep. I've got lots of microbes in my head. Well, in your nose, your, your mouth. Um, your mouth is also a really interesting place, which we'll come to later. And now like a, well, real weatherman, you can actually go to the different places in your body. Okay, so we're in the large intestine now, which is sort of the center of the microbial presence inside the human body, is that right? Yeah, it's actually kind of the capital of your microbiome. About 99% of everything you have in and on you is, um, is in your intestines. Um, and it's, it's about 100,000 billion bacteria, um, which makes you actually more microbe than human. So you're actually, well, nothing more than kind of a meat suit for your microbial <laughs> ecosystem. Um, which we're, is just, we're just vessels for we're the microbes vessels, to exist. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. We're, 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 we're eco, really. We're an ecosystem, um, which is a good thing because, of course, they're not there for no reason. They have a lot of very important functions. I mean, a lot of people, of course, know that they're important for digestion, uh, but they also produce a lot of hormones and vitamins that your body can't produce itself. Um, they train your immune system. They're kind of a first-line defense to keep pathogens away. And recently, we also discovered that they're having a, a big impact on how you're feeling and how you're behaving through the so-called gut-brain axis. And nowadays you see that more and more psychologists, for instance, are actually looking at a, 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 an imbalance in your intestinal flora um, to explain why you might be feeling uh, depressed or have other mental issues. So from, from top to bottom, they're really important for the functioning and the health of your body. It turns out nature had it all worked out all along. It just it's took a us a long time system. to realize yeah, it. Didn't yeah, it? It's a perfect system, yeah. which we are now yeah, really messing up. Well, just that idea of putting trust back in natural processes, rather than thinking that we must have a sort of medicalized and chemical sanitized solution. solution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can we do a different part of the body then? I mean, can we go into the lungs, for example? Yeah, or your mouth that you just into the mentioned. mouth. Okay, yeah. It's one of the most dynamic places. You're eating, you're breathing, you're drinking, you're kissing. So this is actually one of the most dynamic places that you'll find in your body, microbially speaking. So there's about 10 billion bacteria here, which isn't a really, it isn't a, a huge number, but it's mainly the diversity. It's over 400 different species that we find in our mouth. Okay, Emma, um, what were your highlights from 2022? I just spent a little bit of time online talking to experts around the world, because obviously a bit of the tail end of COVID-19. And one of them was this incredible professor down in Melbourne in, in Australia. And he is looking to bring back the Tasmanian tiger, basically from the dead, because it's extinct. And this is de-extinction science. And so Professor Andrew Pask, he is an expert on marsupials and he's looking to sort of bring back, also called the thylacine. And it's a bit trippy really, because if you think, well, hang on, how are you gonna do this? But, you know, the science has changed, it's developed. And so they're able to sort of basically rebuild the DNA. And we're talking like scraps of DNA because a lot of the thylacine, they, they're all sort of bits and pieces from museums and things. So they're trying to have to build the DNA back up. But it's also looking at, I think this was the most important thing in many ways for me, is like what happens when you put an animal back in? Because this died out in 1936. The last one was, was died in Hobart Zoo. So what happens when you bring this animal back into the environment? And he's saying, well, hang on, this was man-made. You know, it was hunted to extinction. And it's actually a vital part of the environment. And so if we put it back in, it will actually help the environment again. Uh, because, you know, the damage that man has done. So I think that was how, how they're going to do it. I mean, he did explain it to me. It's a little bit complicated, but he's a lovely man. And I think it was just the enthusiasm and the passion he had for this. And, um, yeah, I mean, he sold it to me. He said, you know, man has created this damage. And so it's now, you know, he is actually trying to sort of right a wrong. Uh, and, yeah, it was an incredible chat. Obviously, we need a surrogate mother. We need a way to figure out how to gestate this baby. And we don't know how lots of the parts of this technology that we're applying is gonna impact what that final animal actually looks like. We know what they should look like from archival footage and photographs, but we will see as we go through this process if we can actually get to that point of recapitulating or recreating that exact thylacine. And we think we can. One of the great things about marsupials in terms of having a surrogate mum 
is we can actually use that tiny little dunnart, that mouse sized dunnart, to rear or be the surrogate mother for a Tasmanian tiger. And that's because marsupials give birth to tiny, tiny little babies. So even a really small marsupial can give birth to one that's gonna grow quite large. In fact, this group of marsupials to which the Tasmanian tiger belonged and the dunnart, their babies on the day of birth are about the size of a grain of rice. They're about that big and not even your big basmati grain of rice. We're talking like an arborio grain of rice. Those little short grain rice is about the size of their babies on the day of birth. So even that tiny little marsupial can give birth to a Tasmanian tiger. And then you can rear it because once it's born, they just drink milk from the, the mother's teeth, just like other mammals do. So it's possible to hand rear them even from a very early stage of development. Now, how that's going to impact the animal's behavior when they grow up, they should reach their full normal size as we can hand rear them. And we know that we can do this with other marsupials. We can take them out of the pouch very early. We can hand rear them on milk and it doesn't have any impact on them. But in terms of their behavior and the way that they interact, they're not going to be raised by another Tasmanian tiger. But there are most of the behaviors are pre-programmed in animals' brains particularly things like being an apex predator and hunting behavior. These are behaviors that are really hardwired. So we think all of that should be fine. And uh, there are also behaviors that you can also train animals if they lack those abilities. So, you know, we can hand rear orphaned animals all the time, wolves and other sorts of apex predators, and they will inherently take on those normal behaviors. And if not, you can actually train them to have it. Not everyone is happy with this project, but Professor Pask doesn't see it as playing God. Rather, he wants us to look at the big picture, putting certain species back into the environment so they can carry out the critical role they were playing before man hunted them to extinction. What it really comes down to is thinking about which particular animals we might want to apply this technology to. This is definitely not the solution to us losing animals off the planet. This is just going to be another tool in our conservation toolkit, if you like to protecting species. And I think they're the kinds of animals that you would want to bring back and really ethically consider the value of returning an animal like that. Because the Tasmanian tiger is the only apex predator we have in Australia, we don't have any other apex predators, it was the only one that we had. It played an absolutely critical role in the ecosystem and it really stabilizes the health of all the animal populations that sit beneath it in that food chain. You're right about Professor Pask. His enthusiasm was absolutely infectious. And, you know, it's hard to believe he's going to manage it. But I, by the end of your item, I did believe he's going to manage it. <laughs> but uh, you had a bit more inspiration on another trip this year too, didn't you? We went to the Royal Botanic Gardens in, in Kew in London. And this was a wake-up call because we focus so much on animals, don't we? we you know, we've got to save the animals um, that are becoming extinct or they're close to it. But this is happening with plants all over the world as well. So 350 scientists in Kew working with other scientists around the world to sort of research the properties in plants and fungi that may be able to future-proof us. So with climate change and with habitat loss and also hunger, you know, what are the plants that are going to sustain us when, if it gets well, as bad as we think it might get. And of course, I think this story too, it highlights the, a theme that's, that's been with Razor all year in all of our stories, that really uh, we need to save the environment if we're gonna save ourselves. Extinction is a natural process. Species evolve and go extinct. But we think the rate at which that's happening is, is much faster than it was in the past. So it's a concern for us. It might be that that species provides a particular service in the ecosystem, so if we lose that, we might have a knock-on effect for other species that, that may depend on it. Set over 320 acres of ornamental gardens, woodlands and a nature reserve, Kew has the largest and most diverse botanical and mycological collections in the world, with over 50,000 living plants and over 8.5 million preserved plants and specimens. I'm heading into the Temperate House with Dr. Steve Backman, just one of 300 scientists working to understand and protect plants and fungi from their greatest enemy, humans. So Steve, is climate change the biggest threat to plant species? Well, it's certainly a big issue, a big global issue, and in some people's minds, the public is certainly aware of climate change as a threat, but from the species that we've, we've actually assessed uh, for the IUCN red list, which tells us which species are close to extinction, the, the actual dominant threat is still land cover change. So the, the conversion of 
natural habitat into agriculture and pasture land. So that's uh, reducing the range of species and as they get smaller, their risk of extinction increases. The true impact is hard to estimate, even with modelling, because so many plants are yet to be studied in detail. More resources are needed to gather the data to assess the risk. Although for well-known species, scientists estimate 80% of the range could be lost. We're so focused on saving animals like pandas and tigers, but are, are plants just as much under threat? Yes, when, when we first did a, an estimate of how at risk uh, plant species were uh, as, a, as an entire group, we found out that surprisingly they were almost as threatened as mammals, um, which have been comprehensively assessed. Um, the, the problem is we haven't actually fully assessed every species of plant yet because there's at least 350,000 different species that we need to get through compared to you know, 5,500 uh, mammals, for example. So it's a different scale that we have to deal with. So, so at Q, what we do in our team here, we're working on techniques to speed up that process. And for the species that we don't know what the extinction risk is, we can actually do some modelling and some predictions. So that's the work that we're working on at the moment to try and put a, an assessment on each, a, each individual plant species in, in the world. Ray, you've been sitting here very patiently listening to our highlights. Uh, we haven't seen you on screen yet. We will early in the new year though, won't we? And, and your story is another biodiversity adventure, as we're now calling them. Well, I'm really excited to share the adventure I've been on with you uh, to one of the most remote places in Europe to see how uh, a program bringing the Iberian lynx back from the brink of extinction back in the early 2000s to a point where they are now well on their way to thriving. The really exciting thing about this was for me getting the chance to meet the people who have made this happen, who have made it such a success. So I met with the head of the Lynx program at WWF, this is Ramon Perez de Ayala, and he is so passionate about this. It's been his life's work. That view is just breathtaking. Yeah. <laughs> when you first arrived here, the Lynx population was really struggling, and that's been turned around. Tell me about this project that you've been working on and the work you've been doing to make uh, the lynx population here thrive. At the beginning, we only found two populations, two remaining populations, one in Doñana with 30 lynxes, and this one, Andújar, with uh, 70. Right now, we have eight populations and 1,365 lynxes. <laughs> You've been working here for many years. How has the project changed in the decades since you started it? In this hunting state, there was no lynx at all. And right now we have two breeding females. That's uh, between eight and 10 uh, lynxes every year, depending on the size of the cubs. That must be really exciting for you yeah. to have seen such a huge shift. Yeah, it's um, very emotional when you see a lynx uh, where that you have recovered. <laughs> Are you quite confident that the future looks bright for this species? Um, mm, yep. <laughs> if they told us 20 years ago that we will be here, we will be there. Trust that. <laughs> it's clearly a really emotional uh, question. Yeah. Why? It has been my entire life working on that. And hopefully I will retire with the link. Hey. <laughs> It's, it's, it's very fascinating to see that it's such an emotive issue for you, that this is more than just work, this is your life. Yeah, uh, hopefully it will be my entire working life and saving a species from almost extinguished to recovery. <laughs> That's it for this Razor end of year special. Thank you for joining us. It's been a fantastic year with full of inspirational science stories and scientists. We will be back again next year and we hope you can join us. Thanks so much. Take care.